Jesus, the risen Savior. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're so glad that you're here today. We're glad that you decided to brave the possibility of rain uh, to join us together in the place of worship and praise and prayer and fellowship. Amen? Amen. And I hope you've already got a piece of fellowship this morning before you even sat down this today. Well, we're gathered together so we can exalt the Most High King so that we can be together, um, be with one another, encourage one another, uh, help the feeble knees. Amen? That's what we're told to do. So we'll start off with some announcements this morning. Sister Terry, if you would come on. Oh, there it is. I was going to say there was a letter up here. Do you want me to read this? I'll read it. Oh, you'll read it. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Ooh, we got more on this side than we do this side. Let's <laughs> fill this side up now, people. All right, look at your bulletins with me this morning. Um, we're more or less just going down through the list here where we're still collecting for the men's and women's uh, shelter. So uh, there's a listing of those items there on the table in the back. If you want to help out with that. Uh, we are now taking donations for our Operation Bless Frankfurt. There are envelopes there in the back for that. We're going to adopt about 15 foster children this year and we're also going to be helping about 45 kids in the school system. So if you can start, you know, five, ten dollars now and we just keep collecting now until Christmas, we will have enough uh, to buy s supplies for them. Uh, Brother Rusty is studying his um, Bible study this Tuesday, and it will start at 1 p.m. Uh, our next uh, dinner that we will have will be on September the 11th when we have our summer potluck and new membership time together. Uh, Fit Time is still collecting those plastic caps to make benches out of. And the annual WMU Mission Retreat uh, will meet on Monday, September the 12th at 6 p.m. at East Frankfort Baptist Church. Now, men and women, even though it's a WMU-sponsored thing, uh, men and women are invited. There will be a catered, catered dinner and guest speaker, and the church will cover our cost. So if you wish to attend, there's a sign-up sheet for it in the back of the sanctuary, and please sign up by September the 4th if you plan on attending that. Uh, and then our homeless mats, the next time for that is Tuesday, September the 13th at 6.30 p.m. Good morning. As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, I'm reading from Colossians, by the way, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect harmony. Won't you stand with me? I'm going to sing to you, and then you sing back to me. this morning to praise your name. We want you to know that we love you, that we're grateful for all that you've done for us. And we ask, Father, you would draw us 
ever closer in that special bond of love that only comes from you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. As you have a seat, let's go together to hymn number 441. It's not 46 as your bulletin says. 441. And let's sing, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. A scripture reading for us this morning, but before I do that, I want to talk about the value of words. You ever notice that words can lift up and words can tear down? Word, a word that is unfitly spoken can have an effect on a child for the rest of their life, can't it? And the same thing's true about adults, though, isn't it? We're just better at hiding our feelings, but somebody can cut us to the core with just a little snide comment, can't they? But then sometimes words come into our life and they lift us up exceedingly. Well, in Proverbs, let me see which proverb it is because I just forgot. Proverbs 25, written by Solomon, some of Solomon's sayings. Verse 11 says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. And I can remember when I was in um, middle school, um, we called it junior high at the time. I went to Lee's Town Junior High. I had, um, you know, all alligator shirts were all the craze. The preppies were wearing the alligator. The Isada Lacosta stuff, it was just everywhere. Well, I didn't have anything Isada Lacosta. Um, but for, for Christmas or my birthday or something, I found this belt that I just absolutely loved at Doll Hairs. Y'all remember Doll Hairs? And Mom got it for me. And it was an alligator belt. And the belt buckle was framed in gold, and it was a little silver alligator. And I was just just completely enraptured with that those two colors together was just the greatest thing in the world to, to see those and years later I found this word 
this verse. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. And I had a great understanding because of that belt buckle, which seems crazy, but that's how life works, isn't it? And, and, and I can understand what, what Solomon was saying here, how we, when we have fit words or when we speak to somebody in due season and we speak to them in an uplifting manner, what a difference it makes. Well, we got a letter this week um, from Betty Hod Hodson's roommate. And it says this, Brothers and sisters in Christ, I am Mrs. Betty's roommate. She got your card today and she was having a good day and the card made it better. She asked me to write a thank you to her church family. The card brought a tear to her eyes as I read the card to her. If anyone would like to write her, I will read them to her. Bless you all. Your sister in Christ, Marilyn Mahuron. Now, isn't that something? A card at the right time can be so uplifting, not only to the person it was directed to, but the lady in the room with her who had a chance to read that and know that the love of Christ exists in people's lives and a word fitly spoken is like an apple of gold in the setting of silver. The writer of Acts says, Peace through Jesus Christ who is Lord of all. Jesus is our Lord of all. You'll find a song about that on page 296. Just remain seated as we sing Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus is Savior and Lord of my life. My hope, my glory, my all. Wonderful Master Dwight, would you ask God's blessings on our offering? Father in heaven, this morning we're so very thankful for the blessings of life. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful sanctuary and the blessings that you've given to us. Lord, we're so grateful for those who lead us in worship. We pray for Brother Rusty this morning as he brings us God's word. We lift him on high, bless he and his family. Father, I pray for all of those that are enduring hardships that are within our very own state. I pray this morning that you will lift up those that have lost completely everything in their lives. 
Father, I just pray that, um, that you will show them that through this hardship that you will give them even more than they had before. Set them on high ground, Lord, as they go through this difficult time. Pray now, Father, that this offering might go to benefit those in your kingdom, or Lord, those that do not know. And we pray, Father, that it will be spread and, and go tenfold as it goes out in our nation. Lead us and guide us now through this service, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, sister. Amen. Thank you, Brother Tony. Wonderful music this morning. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts, the 15th chapter. As we're moving through Acts, and we're getting a, a good distance in there, um, we're, we're looking at the early stages of the church of Jesus Christ. We're looking at it, how it began. The Acts of the Apostles is called in a lot of our Bibles, but it's actually the Acts of the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit began to indwell believers at Pentecost, and then empowered them to go out and operate and spread the gospel message. Um, Dr. Luke wrote down this for us. He's the author of Acts. And he wrote down the things that he witnessed and heard about as the gospel spread. And people were brought into the body of Christ. And one of the greatest things that happened we saw in Acts chapter 10. Where the Gentiles were welcomed into the church as well by the preached gospel. And that was one of the things that caught everybody off guard. Remember Peter was sent. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he was taught by God that anything that God has made clean, don't call unclean. And so it was a revelation to Peter that God was going to welcome the Gentiles in as well. Now, one of the things that they struggled with is they had this long history. The Jews had a very, very long history of obeying Torah or the law, it's, it's come to be called. 
And the things that God had said, do this and don't do that. Do this and don't do that. And so they were very familiar with that. And that was part of their, their national identity. That was part of their religious identity. That they had the one true God, Yahweh, from the Old Testament, um, seen in, in revealed form as Yeshua or Jesus in the New Testament. And so they were still trying to hold to these things, even though there were many believers that were... Gentile, and there were many believers that were Jewish, they were still trying to hold that the law was first. And that, that you had to go through that. And we'll see that expressed here in Acts chapter 15. But before we get there, I want to remind you of something that Jesus said while he walked on this earth. And so in, in, in Luke chapter 9, um, I love this. This is the, this is the uh, soon to be apostles, the disciples. It says, An argument started among them as to which of them would be the greatest. Sound familiar? We haven't changed a lot, have we? Which of us is going to be the greatest? Which of us is going to make the most impact for the Lord? You can just almost hear the humility in that statement. Which of us will be the greatest? But Jesus, knowing what they were thinking in their heart, took a child and stood him by his side. And he said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me. Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among all of you, this one, is who is great. So Jesus kind of corrected them in their thoughts that those that would lead in his kingdom would be those that were humble and those that were like the child that would come to him in faith and trust and then do as they were told. Then John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to prevent him because he does not follow along with us. So that's kind of the thinking, isn't it? You're not part of our group, therefore you're outside of our group. You, you didn't walk the three years with the Messiah that we did, therefore you don't have the understanding that we have. You're not part of our group, you're not traveling with us. So therefore, you're disqualified. And, and that's kind of a tendency even today. And it was a tendency in the early church to disqualify somebody because they, 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 they thought they were doing it incorrectly. So that's what John said. We saw that and we, we tried to put a stop to it. But listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said to him in verse 50, Do not hinder him, for he who is not against you is for you. He who's not against you is for you. Well, that didn't, that didn't probably register with the disciples at that point. They, they thought, how can they be part of this if they didn't walk the same path? How, how, can, how can they cast out demons in Jesus' name if they're not part of the small group that walks with Jesus? How, how can they do... So let, let me stop you now from what you're doing because you don't understand enough to be part of our group. Does that sound familiar? Things didn't change very much. So as we get to Acts chapter 15, we're going to see there was a big change following that great missionary first trip that Paul and Barnabas and, and John Mark went with them for a short part of the journey. But they went they saw great fruit. And one of the things that we saw in that first missionary journey is that when the, the Jews were rebutting Paul again at their third or fourth stop, they were rebutting him for, for, for just not teaching the law of Moses, for, for not following along with the way that things should be. And so the Jews came against him in almost every single city. And remember one point, Paul says, we're going to go to the Gentiles. It was needful that we come to the Jews first, but you have seen yourselves unfit to the, for the kingdom of God. Therefore, we go to the Gentiles. And it says, and the Gentiles greatly rejoice at this. And so this is Paul and Barnabas' journey. Now, you know word of that travel. Word of it traveled. I mean, Peter had already done what he did with Cornelius. And it had been several years later. And Paul and Barnabas went out. And, and the, at, at one point, they just started going to the Gentiles. Because the Gentiles freely received the message. Now, in that day, a Gentile, a better way to say that would be people of the nations. That would be people that are not Jewish. That's everybody else. And that's the way it was broke out in their mind. So you were either, you were either Jewish or you were not. And if you were not, you were people of the nations. Um, and the word got translated several years ago as Gentile. So that's the word that we use predominantly today. So here he is. Um, Paul's been preaching this and Barnabas has been preaching this. And evidently word of this gets back to the mother church. Now, the mother church, remember Paul and Barnabas' mother church that sent them out was First Baptist Church at Antioch. 
And you remember what a big place Antioch was. It was the third largest city in all the Roman Empire. And, and by this time, there were between 200,000 and 500,000 people in Antioch, Syria, which is where their home church they were launching from. So you can imagine what this Roman city was like. It had everybody in it. Now, Jews were recognized as, as members of this city. And so were any other people that came in, any other tribe, any other nation, any other tongue that came in. They were recognized as citizens in Antioch. So Antioch was very, very, very cosmopolitan. And it was an exciting place to be because they were open to newer things. Remember Paul. Uh, Paul is a, is a Jew that was raised in Tarsus. So he was very Hellenistic. Now that word means he was, he was in, in, embedded into the Greek culture that, around that world. So what they called Hellenized was the Greek culture had permeated into that area. Now the Jews in Jerusalem resisted that. We talked about that earlier. You know, you, you had those that were... Um, they were Hebrew of Hebrews. They were, they were born in Jerusalem. They were raised in Jerusalem or in Israel. But all these other Jews that were outside, well, they weren't quite as clean or quite as pure because they had Hellenistic influences in their life. Well, Paul is one of those that had Hellenistic influences in his life, even though he was somebody who was trained in the Hebrew culture, trained in Judaism, and he was the top of his class. He was, he was trained and raised by a guy named Gamaliel who was considered one of the greatest great disciple makers of the day. They had all these heavy theological debates and decisions. And remember, it was in a Hellenistic synagogue that Stephen was preaching about Jesus, that Paul was, or Saul was there, and he was holding the coats of those that stoned him that were not open to Stephen's teaching about Jesus. So, so there's a schism in there. There's a schism among the Jews about each other. But there's also a schism between Gentiles and Jews. And we've been studying that in Ephesians on Wednesday night about how God made them one person. Well, let's look at this. Verse, chapter 15, verse 1. After they get back from their council, they hang out for a long time in Antioch. And verse 1 says, Some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria and describing in detail the, conversation, the conversion of the Gentiles and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. So, so here's the picture. They're in this First Baptist Church of Antioch, which is a large church, a cosmopolitan church, who has Paul and Barnabas and several other elders who are just well-trained, great teachers of the truth, teachers of theology. And remember, Paul as an apostle was, was one that witnessed Jesus, not in his life, but after his conversion, he was taken to the third heaven and he was trained by Jesus himself on what the truth is, what the teaching is, what the gospel is. So Paul was what he called of himself an apostle born out of season. He still had the title of apostle, the office of apostle, because he was directly sent by Jesus. So he's in Antioch. Barnabas full of the Holy Spirit and, and love and grace and joy. Barnabas was there and he and Paul had traveled and they taught together. Can you imagine arriving at Antioch First Baptist Church by all the greeters in the parking lot trying to direct you where to park your chariot and then when you finally get parked you're trying to go in and they got coffee station up front and, and they've got balloons and visitor parking and, and you go in and, and you see a class to the left led by, by the Apostle Paul and a class to the right led by Barnabas, and you've got to make a decision which class you're going to sit in. Can you imagine the, the power that, that God had invested in these teachers and in these preachers and in these prophets in Antioch, and, and there they were, the hub of Christianity. Remember, it said Antioch that they were first called Christians, which means Christ-like. So it's, it's a great place. And so they're there. They've got Paul. They've got Barnabas and, and several other elders. And they're teaching and they're meeting and they're expounding the Scripture. And then some people come from Judea. Let's narrow it down just a little bit more. They came from Jerusalem. They came from the mother church. They came from where it all started. 
Now remember, primarily in Jerusalem, you're going to have Jewish believers. And there were scads of Jewish believers. Remember before, before the great persecution, they were upwards of 5,000 members at First Baptist Church Jerusalem. Y'all do know I say First Baptist Church tongue-in-cheek, right? There was no denominations then. But they sound like Baptists to listen to them. Fight over anything, love to get together and eat. Met daily, house to house, right, for the breaking of bread. Took up offerings and did head counts. You remember Pentecost? They knew there was 120 there. That's a Baptist thing. We count every single Sunday. You all may not be aware of it, but we count every single Sunday. Just so we have an idea. That's a Baptist thing. So, so First Baptist Church of Jerusalem is where it all started. It's where the apostles that didn't flee, that was their hub. We've got James there, the brother of Jesus. We've got, we've got Peter who's there at this time. And he's, he's in Jerusalem. And so you think you've got teachers in Antioch. You got teachers in Jerusalem. Remember, Peter actually walked with Jesus all those years. Three and a half, three years, three and a half years, he spent time with Jesus, made huge mistakes, but said some unbelievable things by the leadership of the Spirit. He was with Jesus all that time. And so you've got all these leaders in Jerusalem that are kind of uh, maybe a notch or two above. This apostle born out of season, as he says about itself. Well, there's these guys that show up from Jerusalem, from Judea. And what are they bringing with them? They're bringing with them shackles. What shackles? They're bringing with them Judaism. They're bringing with them Moses. They're, they're bringing with them the requirements of the law. And when they show up, they begin to tell the men at Antioch Baptist Church, uh, and you can't be a Christian unless you keep the code. You can't be saved unless you keep the code. So they're, they're teaching works salvation. They're teaching that you've got to do something to earn it. You can't have it until you do these things. That's not the gospel. That's a different Jesus. That's a different gospel. That is absolutely, completely, and 100% wrong. So they begin to teach this. And um, he says, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. When Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and others should go to Jerusalem. Well, that makes sense. These guys came from Judea down around Jerusalem. Makes sense. Let's go back where all this is happening and let's get, let's get a, a decision. So what they have is called the First Church Council. Now, it's not an ecumenical council that we see later on in the 100s and 200s and the 300s where, where people from all these regions and all these different areas, all these bishops came together and made decisions on doctrine. This is just the apostles, Right? It's, this is the first time there's the apostles and there's the elders of Jerusalem church. And they're kind of going to look at things that are going on in the world of Christianity at that point. And remember, it's a very limited world, but growing fast. And so they go, they said, let's, let's, let's appeal to those in Jerusalem and see what they have to say about this. And, and let's see how this goes because a huge debate. And I want you to understand, if somebody comes into you and they teach something that is against the doctrines and the theology of salvation... Now, if they come in and they tell you that the Antichrist is alive and well and he's in Washington, D.C., we can have an argument about that, can't we? We can say, well, maybe. We can say, well, maybe not. We can disagree about that. But that doesn't change anything, does it? People may come in and say, well, you, you can't carry that translation that you're carrying because my translation is superior to yours. Well, we can have a discussion about that and, and we can agree to disagree. But when people come in and they say, Jesus Christ is not enough for salvation. Faith alone by grace is not enough for salvation. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. Or you can't be saved. What did Paul and Barnabas do? They had great debate. And the other translation will say they had no small debate. It was a huge debate. And Paul and Barnabas and others in that church stood their grounds. And so a lot of people wonder, at what point do we argue? At what point do we disagree? At what point do we debate? Well, when it affects salvation, when it affects the free gift of God through Jesus Christ, stand your ground. 
When people start adding to the gospel, they completely destroy the gospel. And that's not something that we can simply agree to disagree on. We need to stand up and say, no, that is not the truth. There are a lot of people that come to you and want to sell you into some other kind of religion. They'll say, well, it's a lot like yours, but it's got a little bit more. Or, yeah, you, you can have your entire Bible, and we've got a whole other book we want to add to that. And you can ask those folks, you can say, is there anything in that book that's not in this book? As far as salvation goes, and they have to honestly say, well, no, you don't need anything added to. But there are interesting things, even in our world today, where we look at people from maybe a different denomination or a different way they keep house. Maybe they're a little more liturgical or, you know, they have more candles and they have um, an order to the service and multiple readings and maybe they have a little bit of flash or, or they have a little bit of marble in there. And, and I know lots of people that are of Baptist descent or some sort of Protestant descent that believe those folks, be it Anglican, maybe even Lutheran, Catholic, would say, they're not saved. And it's interesting because the one thing Jesus told you not to judge is somebody else's salvation. That's the same thing these guys that came from Judea did. They judged the salvation of those that were set free in Antioch. They judged the salvation of the Gentiles they were going to because they didn't keep the law of Moses. And there are a lot of people today that look at different denominations, the way we keep house differently, or we approach things differently, and we say, they can't be saved. I've, been, I've heard that my entire life, and I think that's dangerous ground to get on. And then you look at this story, and you see that Paul and Barnabas took these teachers to task. Where do these teachers come from? They came from the mother church. They came with authority. And they were Christians, by the way. These were people that were believers in Christ. But they believed other things needed to be added to it. And Paul and Barnabas took them to task. See, they had a false teaching of work salvation. They said it wasn't real salvation. And it must be debated. You cannot go along to get along in that situation. You can't just say, well, you believe what you want to believe and I believe what I want to believe. That's the modern world, though, isn't it? People believe you're entitled to believe anything you want to believe. Not when it comes to Christianity. Not when it comes to Jesus Christ. You're not entitled to believe anything you want to believe. still call it Christianity. You can't believe that all the paths in the world lead to Jesus. They don't. But there are people that believe that. Well, you approach God your way, I'll approach God my way. Well, you know what Jesus says? You're on your way to hell. Because Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes into the Father but by me. Pretty narrow-minded, isn't it? And worthy of debate. We don't like that nowadays, but that is the case. And so what did they do? Well, they went to Jerusalem. And they reported all that had been done. And then verse 5 says, But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed up, believed, stood up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. Again, the people, they're in the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem. These are converts from Pharisaism into Christianity. They were believers. They were there. But they had that legalistic background. Have you ever met a legalist? Fun, aren't they? They're fun. Legalists are fun. They're the first ones to point that old scrawny finger at you and say, you're not saved. And they have all these reasons in the world why you're not saved. Even though Jesus said, listen, that's not for you to judge. That's for God to judge. They stood up pointing their finger and said, these people can't be. You know who these people are? Us. Gentiles. Well, you can imagine it. You can, have you ever been in a church situation that had an influx of people from other places? And you grew up in this church. You were there your whole life. Whatever church it was. This one or whatever church. You're there. Next thing you know, you start getting people coming in. And they tell their friends and people come in. They tell their friends and people come in. And I've seen that before. There's, there's this us and them mentality. Previous place I was pastor, we had a few churches in the area that had rocky places every once in a while. We gained three or four people from that church. Well, everybody that was already there were on edge watching them. There is no them in church. If we're in here and we, God is our Father, you don't get to pick who your brother is. Amen? If God is your Father and somebody else has God as their Father, Jesus is their Savior, they're your brother, they're your sister, you don't get a vote. There's no us and those them. There's we. Unified and united under the banner of the headship of Christ Jesus our Lord. There's no us and them. And then I also like it when somebody joins a church and they've been there for a while 
And, and they think that something needs to change. And, they, and they'll come to me and say, you know what y'all need to do? Y'all. Your name's on the roll. There is no y'all. It's a we. But, but, but we're, we tend to kind of separate and isolate that way. Well, here's what the Pharisees are doing. They've been there, man. They walked the walk. Man, they would tithe of mint. If they grew up a mint plant, they'd figure out what a tithe of it was, and they would give that because they, they were adherents to the law to the nth degree except for love. They weren't really loving. They were just trying to do the letter of the law, but they missed the spirit of the law. Well, here they are. They were the ones that all through all the Hellenistic period and, and all through the, the, the different struggles with the Sadducees when they showed up, and they were the ones that held to orthodoxy. They were the ones that held to Torah. And not only Torah, but the rest of the writings of the Old Testament where the Sadducees only dealt with the first five books. And after that, it's all questionable. But the Pharisees, man, they were biblicists. They held to the Word. And, and, and most of them missed Jesus. But then after His ascension, they began to be converted. And so did the Levites. And so did the other priests. And, and so the, the Jerusalem church was made up of people who walked the walk of Judaism. Now, what they didn't understand that Paul was going to tell us later in Galatians is that the law was not there for you to get saved by. Nobody ever got saved by keeping the law. The law was there as a schoolmaster to show you you're completely inept. You're loved, but you can't get there. You've got to have an advocate. You've got to have somebody do it for you, and that's Jesus Christ. And he came to say, I am he who you've been waiting for, the Messiah, the Savior. Remember, the Pharisees didn't like that. They, well, they, they wanted Him crucified, right? Well, now we've got a bunch of Pharisees in the first church. And they did it right, man. They did it right for years. They never let their hair grow down and touch their ears. They always carried a black King James Bible. They always wore the right kind of sandals and the white, right kind of robes. They didn't, they didn't wear bangles and they didn't have flashy gold. I mean, they did everything. They, they worked on, on appearing as humble as possible. And the next thing you know, these dogs, Gentiles, were becoming part of the church in the other parts of the Roman Empire. They were welcomed in. They were filled with the Spirit. And they got a little jealous. They got a little jealous. Because they worked hard to get where they're at. And these other jokers, they just walked in unannounced. Said, yes, I believe in Jesus. And everybody says, it's good enough. They're like, it can't be good enough. It's not good enough. There has to be more. Envy, jealousy. You ever seen that? Yeah, it's a sick, 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 sick thing. Jealousy and envy in the church. So when Paul and Barnabas showed up, now these are the scoundrels. Don't you know the Pharisees knew Paul extremely well? They knew him extremely. They knew who he was raised by. They knew he was trained by Pharisaical teachers. They knew that he knew the stuff. And he's the one that's saying you don't need Moses. You only need Jesus. And they just tore their clothes in frustration and anger because they said that can't be true. You can't just throw away. But none of it was throw away. It was all a picture of what Jesus was going to do. They stood up in the council. And they said, no, 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 no. This cannot happen. So in Jerusalem, they had this huge debate at this first council. Verse 6 says, The apostles and the elders came together to look into the matter. And after there had been much debate, much debate, can you can imagine? Have you ever been to a business meeting where a debate broke out? Well, can you imagine what this was like? These people knew that what they stood for was right and these other people can't be possibly welcomed in because they don't match their view of what it is like. And we're going to have one of the greatest revelations ever. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days, it's been a while, in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word, the gospel, and believe. Now what you probably don't really know about Peter is Peter was more than a Pharisee. Peter was a zealot. Now the zealots, they believed in violence for what they believed in. 
The, the, the zealots were known to be violent people. As a matter of fact, when, when Jerusalem fell in 70 AD, one of the groups that was inside um, that were killing the other groups that were inside was the zealots. They were still there. They were still fighting for what they believed in. You had the zealots and the Essenes and, and you had lots of different people. And so, so Peter used to be a zealot. Remember, he's the one that when Jesus let down that sheet and said, take, kill, and eat, he said, oh, no, Lord. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. Nor am I going to do now. And remember, God did that three times. Take, kill, and eat. And God rebuked him. He said, don't you call anything that I've made clean, unclean. Behold, there are men at the door looking for you. Go with them. So Peter had to be changed. And Peter was such a zealot that when he got there to Cornelius' house, he said, it's unlawful for me to even come into your house. And it's still a little bit lingering on, right? Can you imagine that? I'm making myself defiled by being in your home. Wouldn't you feel welcome? Wouldn't you feel like, oh, I'm so glad you came. Thank you for speaking down to me. You know, can I lay on the floor to appease you or what? Would you like to be carried? I, that was Peter. He said, but the Lord has shown me this day that what He has made clean is clean. And he then began to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Is That happened years earlier. Ten years into Christianity, that happened, but it was still years earlier. So we may be talking, this, this council happened in about 49 or 50. So, so it's been a while. And Peter is the one who stands up. And he could see the same zeal in the Pharisees there that he recognized in his self. And I think it's great because he, he, he said, remember... A long time ago, God made a decision. He chose me. Peter's the one that needed to go because he's the one speaking here today. Amen? So Peter's speaking because he's the apostle to the Jews. He stood up. God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the, uh, upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Peter saw it for what it was. But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in the same way they are also. And I want you to hear this. They are saved through grace, by faith. Sound familiar? Paul said something very similar to that later on in Ephesians. He said, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is a gift of God, so that no one can boast. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. By grace, Jesus Christ offers us eternity with Him. By grace. It's a free gift. Through faith. You've got to have faith. You've got to believe that what he says about himself is true. You've got to believe what the gospel simply states. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, died and rose again the third day, the Bible says that's enough. Now, have you ever struggled with that's enough? Just a little bit, right? How many of you know a Christian that's wayward? How many of you know of a Christian that was on fire at one point and then they completely walked away from the faith. Well, what we typically do is, well, they must not have been ever saved anyway because saved people don't do stuff like that. You know what I have found? Be careful when you say saved people don't do that because you're going to find yourself in a smorgasbord of that a little bit later. I've known many people that, that had the pious or, or overzealous attitude to start selecting who can be in and who can't be in because of the way they live their life or some of the things they've done in their past or, or, or what's going on with other members of their family. I've even seen people kicked out of the church because they had wayward kids. And they said, we don't need you or your type here. You're a blemish on the face of Christ. i tell you who's the blemish. That high and mighty egocentric person that thinks they're better than anybody else. Because we all get to Jesus the same way. Grace through faith. Grace is a get, getting a gift you don't deserve. You don't deserve it. 
God gives it to you. Why? Because you believe in His Son, whom He sent. John 17 says that. But if you believe upon He who God sent, your sins are forgiven. And we know which sins, right? All of them. All prior and all post. Forgiven. They'll never be brought up again. Never held against you again. As far as salvation goes. But there are people that walk around and think, it's too easy. It's too easy. Well, if you were really saved, you wouldn't do this or you wouldn't do that. <laughs> Here's what's funny. When people make that statement, if they were saved, they wouldn't do that. It's funny because you're saved judging them. And when I read Jesus says, if you're saved, you won't do that. You won't judge them. Well, well you know, I've been at this a long time. Starting to sound like a Pharisee. I've been in church my whole entire life. Really starting to sound like a Pharisee. I learned the rules as a child and I've lived by them. Now you are a Pharisee. And that's what these people were doing. Because the Gentiles were welcome in and they didn't have the sign in their flesh of Abraham. Later on, Paul writes and he says, the sign in the flesh means nothing. But those that are Abraham's children are those by faith with the circumcised heart. Oh, people didn't like that. Well, they killed Paul over that. Remember, they ran him out of town because... They're still trying to hang on to Moses. They're still trying to hang on to that. So the council got together. And they said, what are we going to do? And they argued and they fought. Peter stood up and said, wait a minute. Y'all didn't live it. We didn't live it. It's impossible to live it. Nobody's lived it yet. Nobody's lived according to the Torah. Nobody's made it to heaven because they kept the rules. You can't do that. God doesn't weigh you when you get there to see how many good works you did. That's not how Christianity works. That's how cults work. Just got to be good enough, right? Or better than your neighbor. This isn't a battle with a bear. You know how that goes, right? When you have a battle with a bear, you and your friend, you don't have to outrun the bear. You just have to outrun your friend. Right? You never heard that? That's funny. You're a, a lumen now, aren't you? You just have to outrun your friend. That's not how heaven works. I don't have to be better than anybody in the room to get in. I just have to be cleansed from within by the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace. Free gift. Of, how do I get that cleansing? Jesus Christ, my Savior. He died on the cross. I believe that. Therefore, I'm cleansed. I believe that. All the other stuff is trivial. When the Antichrist is going to come, what kind of shoes you can wear to church, none of that's in there. I got to put a jacket on this morning and I thought, why do I put a jacket on? It's a rule. And it's written in here. I've got to put a jacket on. Because if I don't, nobody can recognize me as the pastor. And I know Dwight's going to outdress me. <laughs> it's just a guarantee. We have rules, though, don't we? And we, we, we've made up some silly rules. We call this the house of God. It's not. He hasn't lived in a house since Jesus was born. He quit living in houses and he began to live in homes. He lives in hearts now. Not in this house. Now, this place is set aside for the worship of Jesus Christ, right? It's ordained for that. That makes it special. But it's not where he lives. When we all leave, he goes with us. He's not hanging out here waiting for somebody to show back up. He goes with us wherever we go. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, he goes with us everywhere we go. So here's the situation. They've been fighting. Peter stood up and said, don't y'all remember God picked me? I almost felt like he wanted to say over all y'all. But maybe he's a little more humble now than he used to be. And so he said, let's not put this on them. Let's not make it tough. You're saved through grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then James, he's the actual leader. 
After they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. <laughs> Y'all sit down. Shut up. I got something to say. Simon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. With the words of the prophets agreed, just as is written, that James quotes the Bible. And he mixes and matches verses from all over the Old Testament because he knew his Bible. And you all can read that there from 16 to 18 about how this is something God had prophesied. If you knew what the Bible said, you'd understand that he's going to welcome the Gentiles in. Why are y'all arguing with it? You know why they were arguing? They knew the rules. They didn't know the Word. They knew the rules. They didn't know the Word. Remember what Jesus told the Pharisees and Sadducees or the Sadducees when they were arguing about whose wife this woman was going to be in heaven when seven brothers had married her and all of them died? Jesus said, well, your problem is you don't know what Scripture says. And they were arguing from what they thought were the Scriptures. But they didn't understand what it meant. That's why Bible study is so very important. Therefore it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles. But that we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols. And from fornication. And from what is strangled. And from blood. For Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach him. Since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. You know what James is talking about? He's talking about discipleship. He said, so let's tell those pagans, those people of the nations, that they don't need to eat meat offered to idols. Now why would James say that? Well, because they're pagans. They've been doing that. That's what they came from. Everything James names here is something these people, when you get over in Asia Minor, which is where Paul and them are coming from, when you get over in this area, you've got every, especially the Antioch, you've got every religion known to man. There are around 500,000 people doing who knows what kind of dastardly things. Everybody in Jerusalem knew about it. Now, you wouldn't go into Jerusalem and say, don't eat meat offered to sacrifice. You know why? You ain't going to find any. You're not going to find meat offered to idols in Jerusalem. It wasn't anything they necessarily say. But these Gentiles, these pagans that were coming in, people of the nations, James said, you know, you need to not eat meat contaminated by idols. Okay. And abstain from fornication, which was part of their worship rituals as pagans. If you know anything about Corinth, you know what I'm talking about. He said, y'all need to quit doing that. It's not godly. And from what is strangled, because there was cleanliness codes, kosher codes, on how to kill animals. As a matter of fact, some of the teaching around this time was that no Jewish person should eat more than an olive's worth of blood as they go through their day. And so that's just blood that's contained in the meat that, that didn't come out of the meat. They had ways to kill and ways to slaughter and ways to do that. So they had these strict dietary codes and, and he's simply telling these people who would cook their animals in blood or they had rituals where they would drink the blood. It still goes on around the world today. He said, y'all need to stay away from that. You need to stay away from the meat that's strangled that wasn't properly killed and you need to stay away from eating blood. That's it. But that's not for salvation. That's just part of being trained. That's just part of realizing who you are in Christ and beginning to walk that path. Because he goes on and says, because Moses is taught everywhere. If you want to find out about the other rules, you want to find out about the other things where God says, you know, He cares more about us being obedient than He does about making sacrifice. You want to find out about how God loved the world. You want to find out how God made the world. All that's being taught in the synagogues every Sabbath day. These people can then learn what the Word of God says. And then they can begin to grow according to the Word of God. But right off the bat, here's a few things y'all nasty people need to quit doing. Right? But he wasn't saying that to be saved. These are the people that were saved. You don't have to go by the things these people were teaching. Then he sends a letter. And in the letter it says, We heard that some men came from this area. We did not send them. And that they caused you much trouble. Basically, it was a welcome aboard letter. Don't you like those? And here's the effect this letter had. So, so he's teaching them to learn and to be discipled. 
Verse 30. So when they were sent away, they went down to Antioch. So Paul, Barnabas, and the group from the church at Jerusalem were sent. And having gathered the congregation together. I bet that was interesting. Big congregation. They delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. How do you catch more flies? You ever been encouraged? Exhorted? Encouraged? You're doing good. A few things you might want to change, but you're doing good. Instead of, you're an absolute failure. Did you not understand anything I taught you? Did you, could you imagine if pastors did that? Preach a sermon? Then find out somebody's doing something he just preached again. Call you on the phone? You're ignorant. Did you not understand the words that were coming out of my mouth? How's that going to go? Are y'all looking forward to that call? Nobody is. Nobody wants that. Encouragement though. You're doing good. Keep at it. Keep studying. When people say, how is it that, that, that I'm supposed to walk? Read the Bible and apply it. What you understand. Because the Spirit gives us what we need. You're not going to read it and fully get it. First time through. Nobody does. Nobody does. It ever unfolds. And you get a little bit of it. And you begin to adapt to that. And then you get a little bit more. And you adapt to that. You know why we do that? Because we love Jesus. Because we love what He's done for us. We love the grace. And we love that He came to this earth and died in our place. And we're encouraged to, to strive after that. To walk after Him. We're not condemned to walk after Him. We are encouraged to walk after Him. To apply the Word of God to our everyday life. And that's not, that's not to, do, be, to be anybody who's not growing that way. It's an encouragement to say... You want to understand more about what it means to be a Christian. It's not a list of don'ts. And you, you know, for years, that's how we identified ourselves. We don't drink, we don't dance, we don't chew, we don't play cards, we don't get divorced, we don't cheat on our wives or husbands. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't. What did we find out? All that was lies. And we come in on Sunday morning and put on faith. You know the old joke. Baptists know everything except one another in the liquor store. We had all these rules. I have sat down and I don't know how many homes and counseled with people because I was a local pastor in the mountains. And it was people that were told because they were divorced they were not welcome in a worship center. They were not welcome to even attend. I sat down with wives who were in an abusive relationship and their pastor told them, you stay with him and you obey him, he'll quit hitting you. Now how stupid do you have to be to believe that to be true? I'm talking about the pastor, not the woman. Because she's been told by all the men in her life, no matter what, you walk one step behind him, you always smile, be dressed to please, have that dinner made, happy wife, happy life. Right? Yeah. Ain't true, is it? Because it takes work. None of that's true. None of that. For years and years and years, we tried to convince ourselves that if we kept the rules that we were taught from pulpits, that our life is going to be blissful and happy. And, and ours never was. So you know what we did? We had to put on a face when we came to church. And smile even though we're broken in the middle. And smile even though we're hurting to the depths of our life. And, and smile like nothing bothers us. And, and we have time for prayer requests. And, and we, never, ne we never say, I need to pray for me. I'm sinking. It's overwhelming me. The waves of my life. Because we've been taught that this sanitized hour that we get together, we can't have brokenness. We can't have pain. We can't have hurt. And you know what that's caused? Our roles to diminish. People don't want a part of it anymore. People are walking away from it left and right. I mean, you take the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest denomination in the world, and evidently the most inappropriate with its ministers, swept under the rug. What's Southern Baptist Church? 
I hate that. But it's true. You act like the Pharisees at the first Jerusalem council. No, not us. Yeah, us. We get a whole lot further with honesty, don't we? We get a whole lot further with encouragement. We get a whole lot further rather than condemnation. An explanation of what the struggle is really like. Walking the walk of a Christian is not for the weak hearted. It's not glitz and glam. It's not all the money and all the health that you can stand. Even though that's being sold from pulpits this morning. It's a struggle from the get-go. And it's this internal struggle that nobody else can see. That's why Paul says, I die daily. And these people at the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem had kept these rules their whole life. Can you imagine if you did all you could do to keep the rules just to find out the rules won't fix you? These people over here, snotty nose, blood drinking, fornicating Gentiles. Why, they're just as equal in the kingdom of heaven as you are. They didn't like that. They got jealous. They got envious. And they tried to make them jump the hurdles. Peter and James stood up and said, yeah, we're not going to do that. Turn your life around. Start walking in the ways appropriate for being a believer. Thank you and welcome to the family. And when they, when they got the letter back at Antioch, they rejoiced because it was encouragement. And I think that's important for us today. So we see the first Jerusalem council. One of, the, one of the main things we get out of that is you don't have to follow the rules of Judaism to get in. But one of the other things that we see that, that Peter brought out and then Paul brings out later and they keep bringing it out, keep bringing it out. We are saved through grace. And that by faith. So as we prepare for an invitation this morning, I'd like to, I'd like to have an invitation um, because I want to talk about what it means to be saved by grace. So if you would, would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And in just a moment, we're going to have an invitation. And I don't know if you're in here this morning. And maybe you've been, maybe you've been brought down or put low by some teachings in the church. Or, or maybe you have felt like you're not worthy to be a part of the body of Christ. Because you've got a past. Or because you've got things in your life you struggle to shake. I want you to know that there's room at the table for you. Jesus Christ has spread a table and everybody is welcome. They put their faith and trust in Him. That He came knowing who you are. Knowing the things that you've done in your life. Knowing the very thoughts in your head. He still said, you're welcome to come. And if they, you by faith, which means trusting in something you cannot see will come to Him in belief. He'll provide the grace, and that's getting what you don't deserve, which is God's heaven and God's forgiveness. When we talk about are you right with God, when we talk about are you at peace of, with God, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about you've come to Jesus Christ in faith, and you have received Him. You have faith and trust in Him. And He has forgiven you. Now you may not be completely convinced that He has forgiven you because only you know the dastardly things that you've done, said, or thought. But Jesus said there's no sin so great that He won't receive you. The only sin that keeps you from God's grace is a denial that He exists. The refusal to put faith and trust in Him. Blaspheming of the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost comes to you and He convicts you of your sin and your need for salvation, your need for forgiveness, um, the devil comes to you and says, Not you. You're as good as any deacon in the church. You're as good as any pastor in the church. You don't need to repent. You don't need this Jesus or this story isn't true. And you turn your back and walk away from the free gift. That's the only sin that can't be forgiven. is a rejection of Christ. Now, if you're in here this morning and you're not absolutely positive that Jesus Christ is your Savior, that you put your faith and your trust in Him, that you are relying on what He did at Calvary with your eternal soul. If you're in here this morning and, and maybe you've not received an encouraging message that yes, you're welcome at the table. 
Maybe you've always felt like you weren't good enough. Jesus opens his arm and says, I love you this much. You are welcome to come and dine with him. That offer is the same offer this morning that it was when Peter went to Cornelius' house. It's the same offer that happened when Jesus Christ rose from the dead and the disciples saw him. He received them in faith. You could do it as a child, but believing in Jesus Christ. So this morning, we're getting ready to stand. I'd like to sing a song of invitation. The invitation is simply this. If you feel like you need to come talk to me for any reason, come on down. We'll talk. If, if you feel like you need to talk to me about salvation, we'll begin that conversation today and we'll carry that out over the days that we need to to talk about what it means to be saved. Maybe you're struggling with discipleship that you've been saved but, but you've never been baptized. And you'd like to say, hey, I'd, I'd like to be baptized because I, I've not been baptized and I struggle with it. Maybe you say, you know what? I'm, I'm a member of, of, of another church, sister church in the area, and I'd like to move my membership to this church, we can talk about anything. If the Holy Spirit moves in your life to take some sort of action this morning, walk down this aisle. And if you don't know, but you feel an urging, and I don't know, we'll meet together and pray about it until we know for sure why God led you to walk this aisle. So let's, let's have a time of invitation, brother. Sing him 305. Can we stand with you to do that, please? I have decided. Side. 